transition to zero emissions by 2050 is for developing countries a very serious challenge because here we're looking at we're looking at um, two different two different existential problems the first of course is global warming and its implications but for us is also uh, much more significant, a development challenge, problems around poverty and energy access. So how do we, uh, for us, how do we deal with extreme poverty and getting millions of people out of extreme poverty and of course its implications, disease and all of that, and premature mortality. And at the same time, meet uh, the objectives of the uh, meet the objectives of, uh, of uh, our climate change objectives, especially net zero by, by 2050. So for us, the process of getting to net zero by 2050 and development and ensuring that we're able to take millions of people out of poverty must be, fat, must be thought of together. Energy, of course, uh, is a huge part of that. The, the whole energy challenge is a huge is a huge part of that. So for us, the process is as important as the objective. In other words, that transition is as important as getting to net zero. Because the transition for us has to be a just transition. It has to be a transition that is fair and balanced. If we don't have a transition that is fair and balanced, then we're going to end up you know, jeopardizing the lives and livelihoods of millions, you know, while at the same time exposing ourselves to, to the uh, great dangers of, of global warming. So in, in, in addition uh, to that, of course, is the fact that all of the global issues to which we have signed up, the SDGs, even the Paris agreements, you know, expect that there will be an inclusive, equitable planet and people uh, transition, as opposed to uh, one that's just heading, uh, as a, one that's just heading for 2050, without taking into account the various issues that would uh, uh, that would attend uh, the transition for countries such as ours. Now, well, I think also an important point that. Um, we, uh, we ought to make, you know, and this is also an important preliminary point, is that today uh, we're faced with a situation where many of the wealthier countries are, of course, moving quickly towards uh, net zero emissions, but are also insisting on banning all publicly funded fossil fuel projects, including gas. So we have examples such as the European Union, the UK and Denmark, uh, to mention a few, as well as specific institutions such as the Sweet Fund, uh, the World Bank, and several other, you know, uh, several other institutions and development finance institutions at the moment. And they're saying, well, in order to meet, uh, to, to meet the objectives of net zero by 2050, we need to buy all fossil fuel investments and gas investments as well. Now, in, there are even there are institutions, for example, the African Development Bank. I just prepared to take a more nuanced approach. So the African Development Bank says, okay, we, we, we accept that um, it might be good to ban uh, hydrocarbon investments, but that gas, for example, is an important transition fuel. So we must have a way of uh, preserving gas, uh, uh, gas um, investments and gas funding. But even those institutions, such as the African Development Bank, are finding it extremely difficult because, of course, they are part of an ecosystem and they are also not being funded. So they're finding it difficult to close any deals 
that involve hydrocarbon uh, that, that involve hydrocarbon funding. So gas projects are you know, practically all around the world, and especially in the developing countries and in Nigeria, are finding, of course, difficult to get any sort of investments in gas projects. Now, that is a major uh, challenge for us because that approach is not mindful of even, you know, all of the commitments that we've made as nations of the world to common but differentiated uh, uh, common but differentiated aspirations and all of that. And it, it's evident to us that if things go this way, we will end up in a situation where the economies of countries such as ours are completely damaged. And what we're trying to avoid, namely, you know, uh, all of the fatalities, mortalities, and the, the loss of lives and livelihoods as a result from climate change. We're going to end up with those figures anyway, because what we need to be able to get from the point we are to 2050 will be to ensure that our people are able to survive and live uh, their lives and all of that. And if, if, if that is taken away, then we have uh, a, a very, we're, we're put in a very difficult situation. Now, I just want us to then ask ourselves a question. So how does a just transition look? How would a just transition look? How would a fair you know, transition to 2050 look? You know, because obviously at the point that we're trying to make is that we cannot, uh, as if we cannot today have a fair transition if we are following the programs as laid out you know, by uh, many of the wealthier countries. So I think that a just transition, and I'm sure many of us are familiar with these facts, you know. For example, we know that excluding South Africa, the remaining one billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa are serviced by a power generating capacity of just 81 gigawatts of power. So outside of South Africa, all the power that's available in sub-Saharan Africa is 81 gigawatts. And all of that has contributed less than, than 1% of cumulative uh, uh, CO2 emissions. Now, most countries on the African continent, of course, are low emission uh, and, of course, energy poor countries with per capita emissions of somewhere in the order of 0.8 to 1%. That's all of what you know, many of these countries, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. And an average of under two tons per capita if South Africa and Northern African countries are included. So even if we triple electricity consumption solely through natural gas, if we triple electricity consumption in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa using uh, natural gas, will just add up to 0.6% to global emissions. Now, compare that to the United States, which has an installed capacity of 1,200 gigawatts of power and a population of 331 million people. And its emissions stand at 15.5% per capita. Now, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the UK has uh, 76 gigawatts of installed capacity for 67 million people. So per capita energy uh, capacity in the UK is almost 15 times that of the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, and on the average, Europe has a, a, a per capita emissions of 6.5 tons. So uh, I think we can learn, you know, and the truth of course is that given those kinds of figures, it's evident that for those of us in Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa, we are the least polluters, we have the least emissions, we are the worst affected, and we're being asked to make the kind of sacrifice that will literally cripple our economies and make it impossible for us to ensure that our people are able to live normal lives going towards 2050. So that's the so that, that's the kernel of the of, of the of the argument. And so I, I, I think that what we need to do obviously, is to ask how then can this be made uh, to work? 
you know, uh, is evident that if African countries, especially the uh, hydrocarbon rich African countries, are allowed to or are funded in order to be able to achieve uh, uh, their, their targets, we still would not have, uh, and of course to use clean energy resources, we still would not have any of the uh, very terrible con consequences that um, would, that, would, that, that may be envisaged. Now, I want to also just point out that natural gas is currently used for industry, for fertilizer manufacturing and cooking. And these are more difficult to transition than power generation. LPG is already today replacing the huge amounts of hazardous coal and kerosene cookstoves that are most widely used for cooking while saving millions of lives that are lost to indoor air pollution annually. So we have a situation where in order to transit to cleaner fuels, uh, we need gas. So for example, we know that cooking gas is the best replacement for coal and firewood, which is what the vast majority of uh, people in the, in the rural areas all across sub-Saharan Africa use today. Now that is dangerous, not only because it's a major pollutant, but also because of the, uh, because of the, uh, the exposure to uh, dangerous gases in-house. And of course, a lot of the fatalities have resulted from that. So we need to transit to clean, cleaner cooking, and cleaner cooking means using LPG, but which of course, as you know, is gas. We're also looking at how to transit from uh, petrol for cars to LPG and CNG, which of course are cleaner, you know. Now, to do that, of course, naturally, uh, we need gas. So ev practically every step of the way, you know, we're going to need gas as a major transition fuel in order to uh, be able to meet not just the, our energy demand, but also in order to be able to make the transition to, to, uh, to, to much uh, cleaner, to more cleaner fuels. So I, I think uh, in, in, in order to then achieve our aims, in order to get to where we're going, and also uh, to ensure that we're able to do so in a manner that, that takes into account all of, our, uh, all of the challenges uh, that have outlined. We need to ensure that we're adequately funded for that transition. Now, if we're going to achieve net zero by 2050, and we've drawn up a very, a very comprehensive uh, energy transition plan, we have the able, very able assistance of the Energy Transition Council. A few minutes ago, I met with uh, Alok uh, Sharma, who is the chair of that, and Daniel is the co-chair of the Energy Transition Council. And they helped us uh, quite a bit in being able to produce an energy transition plan. Now, that energy transition plan just tells us how we're going to get from uh, now to assuming that 2050 is the target for zero emissions. How do you get there? What will it cost? And what sort of options <coughs> are we going to deploy? what sort of energy options are we going to deploy? And for us, access to energy. How do we ensure access to energy to millions of uh, people who require, uh, that who require electrification? Now, in order to do that from point A to point B, we're going to need about 400 billion in non-business as usual, $400 billion that is, you know, over business as usual funding. Now, that's quite a bit of money, considering that that's almost the size of our GDP, right? And the commitments that have been made since Paris of $100 billion a year have not been made even for one year, you know? So we're at a point where, you know, obviously, we think that it's a, it will be important for us to uh, be uh, more intentional about how we are able to promote our own, our own, uh, our own position 
and enable and, and ensure that that funding is available. And if you look at it, there's currently a mismatch, you know, uh, in energy investments. So while representing just 15% of the world's population, high-income countries received over 40, sometimes 45% of global energy investments. At least uh, the figures we have from 2018 show that that is the, that is the case. So developing countries with 40% of the world's population receive just 50% of uh, global energy investments. Energy consumption in developing countries has doubled in the last 15 years and is expected to grow another 30% in the next 50 years. So making capital available to fulfill our own growing energy demand and the energy demand of our regions of the world is central to reaching uh, the goals of the Paris Agreement. I think that this is a point that we've made repeatedly and which we uh, will continue to make. So while we are resolutely committed you know, to all of our uh, goals, uh, uh, all of our, uh, the goals that we've set out for uh, ourselves under the Paris Agreement, obviously we're, and we've also in fact recently updated our ambitions uh, especially our NDCs, our, our, our contributions were significantly updated because certainly we, we are committed to uh, the process. But we also strongly believe that that process is one that has to be fair, has to be just, and has to be supported, not just for Nigeria, of course, but for most uh, African countries and for many countries in the developing world who have the same kinds of concerns that we have. Uh, and, and just as I, just before I close, I'd just like to uh, mention that, so in, in going to COP26, obviously there's so many issues that are arising. Now, after looking at our own plans, setting out our own plans, and what it will cost, what it will take, you know, where, for, for example, in Nigeria, with under our economic sustainability plan, we're doing a major um, solar power project, you know, where we're connecting 5 million homes to solar power. That's about 25 million individuals under our economic sustainability plan. Now, that's just one phase. I mean, 5 million or 85 million is, you know, really just scratching the surface. But the most important part of that is that that whole uh, enterprise requires gas as base load, especially if we're going to use this as grid, if we're going to put it on the grid. So we want to be able to put renewable energy on the grid. We want to ensure that, you know, of course we have solar home systems, but we need renewable energy on the grid. We need power, power for, for industry, right? And of course, you know, we're still, by looking at the significant costs of that. So everything that, that needs to happen now and all of what uh, we're looking at, obviously will come down to, you know, how much this is going to cost, how long it will take and all that. And we're the first uh, African country to develop a, a comprehensive plan. And looking at the plan and looking at the targets, looking at the cost, Every time someone says 2050 is the target, and you know, we look at our plans and the cost and how much uh, we, we expect to find, and so far, the kinds of commitments we've received around the world. For us, it's looking pretty challenging. I mean, and that's just to put it as delicately as possible to be able to get to uh, uh, net zero by 2050. So, again, just to say uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak to you and I hope uh, that we'll be able to collaborate even more, especially with some of the great work that uh, Mark Howells and his team are doing. Thank you all very much.